Uh, thank you all for uh, coming out tonight. Uh, for those of you, particularly a couple of you in the room I've seen have been here for, this is now the sixth uh, session of, of the series that have been here for all six. Uh, appreciate it very much. For those of you here for the first time, I don't know what you've been doing, but that's okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, and thankfully I know uh, most of you, my name is Kevin Cooper. I'm with the Greater Sarasota Chamber of Commerce, and we are happy to, to uh, host this series uh, as, a, as a look into the community as to what's happening with uh, transportation, mobility, and, and the human conditions surrounding engaging with transportation and mobility, as it's kind of one of those things that is ubiquitous in our community uh, is transportation, traffic, and getting around. How do we get to things? Uh, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons that across the United States, really, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we get to things. Uh, and, and so Sarasota is no different in the fact that much of the conversation in the community uh, revolves around the time it takes to get to things, what a pain it is to get to things, do you know a better way to get to things, what time do you get to things, and how does all this work? And so for us, it was important to, to take a big, uh, uh, kind of a global look. Hey, Francine, how are you? Good. Uh, to take a look at that and, and bring as many people into the co no it's fine uh, bring as many people into the conversation as possible so uh, for us it's it's been a very uh, interesting look back and we had some of this we had all of our previous speakers uh, rotating on the screen up here if you hadn't had a chance to uh, uh, look at each of the series you can go on online uh, slideshare.net forward slash greater Sarasota chamber uh, all of the previous slide decks and all of the videos of the events are up there for your review uh, to take a look at them. If you've missed any, uh, if you've missed any of the series, please go ahead and take a look back at that um, so to get caught up. But tonight, um, what we wanted to do was take a look at where do we go from here. So we did a five-week series. We started off in week one with just some real basic terminology definitions. What are we talking about? Uh, so we can have kind of a common language around it because I think a, a common language about transportation and mobility really escapes a lot of people. And that's not because they can't understand it or they don't want to understand it. It's just not something that's in your normal vocabulary when we talk about traffic studies and you talk about congestion and levels of service. That's just not something in an everyday uh, a vocabulary. So it was interesting. And then we t went all the way to, to the last uh, session, week five, when we had Rick Hall, uh, a really well-renowned planner, come in to talk about really creative solutions uh, now that we have a common, uh, a common vocabulary, common understanding, a common lens, what do we do with this thing? And so this week we wanted to do two things, was uh, discuss some uh, kind of emerging themes. So we went back and reviewed all five weeks and said, okay, what are some of the things we heard more than one time from different speakers? And you all should know from the speakers, uh, we, we did not know what they were going to say, and they did not know what each other was going to say. We kind of gave them the general overview of, hey, this is the topic and bring your expertise to the table. And none of them knew who the other speakers were going to be. If they wanted to go back and review, they could have. But uh, so we want we're really interested in what did we hear multiple times? What, did, what were kind of the emerging themes? And I'm going to cover a few of those things that emerged. And then Chris is going to come up and talk about, okay, so where do we go from here? What do we do with this stuff? And whose role is it? Uh, and how much does it cost? And when should that happen? And how should that work? And I hope it's going to be more of an interactive discussion with the room about those things because it's important that we all kind of have a sense that it's not just one person's responsibility because who's responsible for transportation? Uh, it, it's not just the government. Uh, it's not just the users. It's not just, it, it's not just one person uh, as we all engage in it. So uh, he will take you through some of that. Um, I hope that makes sense. So like I mentioned, we have some emerging concepts and themes, and, and there's more than I can probably go through, but I thought there were some that were particularly maybe relevant to cover in terms of their themes and concepts that we can look at. Um, none of them are necessarily here is what we should do, but they're just things I think that were, that were mentioned by multiple people uh, that carried throughout that might give us a sense of, of thought process through it. And the first one was the importance of the grid. Andrew Georgiatis talked about it at, at length, the importance of the grid. Uh, and, and Rick Hall talked about it as well in, in how the grid works. And Christopher Hatton mentioned a bit in how they look at traffic studies. So when they look at the, the diameter around a traffic study where they look at what they look at. Uh, the second piece was trip generation. So what are trips? Where are they generated? How are they generated? How do you think about trips? And then when you're doing traffic studies, what are the things you think about? The third is uh, multimodal transportation, which should come as a surprise to no one in the room. Uh, that that's something that has emerged as, as, you know, it's not just about cars. You know, how else are we getting around? 
And then the fourth piece was contextual street design. So how are we uh, designing our streets moving forward and what is that gonna look like? And so the first part was the importance of the grid. And, and this was something that caught a lot of attention and, and, uh, and it was, was mentioned multiple times. And I think it's something we've talked about a long, I, I think it's not a new concept of transportation, but I think it's important for us if we're gonna have a collective lens on what we're doing to understand it. And it kind of starts with this, is you know, this can be your town, this can be your neighborhood, this can be kind of anywhere where a street network exists. And when you start to look at a grid, you might have a street here and you have a street here. And what you want to do at any given point in time is you want to get from your starting point to your ending point. You want to get from point A to point B. And you start to think about, well, how can I get to point A to point B? And, and there's always one assumption built in, and that's you want to take the most efficient route. You always want to kind of move towards your destination. You're not going to go over here. Uh, you forgot your cell phone. You're going to go back. You're going to get to here. Your wife calls you, and you forgot something again, and you got to go back. But you're always going to kind of make a logical progression forward uh, towards the grid. And the question becomes, when this is your grid, how many options do you have to go from your starting point to your destination point? How many options are there? A and options are important things. And when you look at this grid, um, if you're a, a giant nerd, what you know is that you have this many options. Um, and and, uh, and um, I happen to like math, and I know that's how many options you have. This is the, I this is the iPhone, this is the iOS 11 problem. So you have this many options uh, to get from start to, to finish, but uh, how can we confirm that? So what you can do with here is you can kind of start here, and here's a, here's a path you can take to get to where you're going, and that's a general path. So that's, that's one way to get where you're going. But there's more ways. You can do this. You can do this. You can do that. You can do that. And you can do that. So you have a lot of different options to get where you're going, and that's important. You have six. You have six options in this grid. Y and you have six options in this grid, and this is called a factorial, if anyone really wants to, to you know, uh, spicing up a, a, a cocktail party. So here's your grid, and there's your six options of what to do. So what happens when you build another street? You know, how many options do you have then to get from your start to your finish? You have 10. So when you add one street here, you jump from six options to 10 options. And then what happens when you build another street and you want to get from start to finish? You go up to 20 options. So you've literally, you've built two streets here and you've more than tripled the options you have to go from the same start to the same finish. And then when you build a third street and you want to go from start to finish, you have 35 options of how to get where you're going. And think about that. We, we built three streets and we went from, s we went to an almost an order of magnitude in options of how to get where we're going. By just building three streets, we created a grid. So what happens if you take that out? It doesn't look all that big. What if that's a cul-de-sac? So what if that's there but it doesn't connect anything? And you want to go from start to finish you've lowered your options to 31. So you, you, you've, you've decreased your options of how to get from start to finish by over 10%. You have 10, you have almost, it's actually about 12% less options of how to get where you're going. And options end up being very important in transportation. Options are really what keeps transportation going to a certain degree. Uh, consider there's an, there's an accident on this road. Well, that road might become a lot more important. And so how does that factor into the decision making and then what do you do if along here, what you want to do is, is you widen this road. If you go from uh, a four-lane road to a, to a six-lane road, so two lanes each way to three lanes each way, and you want to get from start to finish, you still only have 31 options. So that same, uh, that same accident, that same problem can, can doesn't provide you any more options. And so the, the thought of and the importance of the grid is, is you're always going to continue to build roads, I suppose. That's never going to stop. But, are, you know, I think from a community, are you a, are you a road builder or are you a connection maker? Are you about making connections or are you about making roads? And when you add roadway, uh, are, you, are you adding lanes or are you adding connections or are you adding both? And so uh, one isn't necessarily worse than the other or better than the other. Uh, uh, but the thought is, uh, when you think about it, I think it, we always inherently go to, 
okay, you know, if there's a problem, you build another, you build another lane and, or another, you, know, you lengthen the queue or you do whatever you do. But in thinking about it, it was interesting to really step back and think about, well, how are the connections being made and what are the importance of the connections that are there uh, as they relate to the system? So the second was trip generation. Uh, and this was really good for the vocabulary, but it was also good in understanding about how our land use patterns interplay with us in terms of trip generation. So uh, here you have a house. And, and for the sake of trip generation, this would be called the origin. So this is where you might start. You wake up in the morning. Uh, if you're like me, you shower. If you're like Howard, you don't have a shower. Uh, and you do whatever you do. Uh, and then you get in your car, and you, you take a trip, and you go to work. And there's your destination, and there's a trip, and it's, it's magical. And you've taken a trip, and, and that's what it is. Uh, and, and that's kind of how it works. And then later on in the day, you get back in your car and you go from the destination back to the origin, and that's a second trip. And you have two trips, and it was wonderful. But you know, the question is, are all workplaces the same? You might have a really, uh, if you have a bank that's heavily trafficked, you might have a lot more trips generated from it. If you have a, if you have a very, uh, you know, a, a research scientist facility that's the same square footage, you might have much less trips doing it. So the box might not matter as much, I suppose. But it's what's going on in there that really matters. Uh, because you have very different uses that create different things. And then something Christopher Hatton walked us through was, okay, so you start off in the morning, uh, you're heading into work, and then you stop at a gas station. Did a trip happen? Did that gas station create a trip? And then you go to work, and on the way home, you're a good husband, and you stop at the florist, and you pick up your wife some flowers because you don't do it often enough, and you should do it more often, not that that's me. But and, and was that a trip? You know, did, did a trip actually occur? And, and the, the answer is it depends. Um, and, and the thought is it may or may not, depending on whether or not it's passed by capture. So if, uh, if me, I live East County, and I live off Palmer Boulevard, and I take Palmer to Honore, I take Honore up to Fruitville, and I take Fruitville in. If on the way into work I stop by a gas station on Fruitville and fill up my car and then I continue on to work, and then on the way home I stop at the flower shop on Beneva in Fruitville and I continue on my way, a trip was never generated because the trip was my house to work. I was going to do that anyway. And because I happen to be on Fruitville and I stop at these places, that gas station didn't create a trip and the florist didn't create a trip. That's passed by capture. Now, if I, go to, if I get off the road, if I get off Fruitville and I go to Beneva to pick up my flowers, that's a new trip because that's not what I was doing anyway. Uh, it, so it, it's, it's the use that creates the trip, and that's an interesting thing for us to think about, I guess, as we look at how trips happen. So you also you get up in the morning, and you, and you head to work, and you're at your destination. Is it always a trip? Paula, is it always a trip? If that's my destination is a trip, but are there different kinds of trips? There are different kinds of trips. Paula is a transportation for Sarasota County. So what if I don't go on a major roadway network? Is it different? And that's internal capture, and people talk about this in development in terms of, of, of uh, mixed-use development. Because if I don't enter onto the major roadway network, let's say I, I get up and, uh, and I'm able to go do something. I'm able to actually exit, exit one. I'm able to go from my origin to my destination, and I don't go on the major roadway network. I'm a trip, but I didn't leave anywhere. I didn't put anything on the roadway network. And that's the kind of the, the, you know, someone would call the holy grail of mixed-use development. If you can create a lot of trips, but you never go, I might never go on Fruitville Road. I might never hit the major arterials. Uh, and so is that important? Is that, is that something you look at? The other thing with trip generation is timing. So when, when do we pay the most attention to timing of, of roads? What do we really talk about a lot, the time? Rush hour, peak hour. That's when it happens, right? So that's when we're going from home to work. That's, that's what we're doing. But it's interesting, and it, it was brought up. So it, are most trips work-related or non-work-related? Non-work-related. They're, they're interestingly enough, when you look at trip generation, most trips, think about it. If Monday through Friday I go to work, that's 10 trips. I go to and from work every day. But if I go from work to lunch twice a week, there's four trips. And if I go to the grocery store twice a week, there's another four trips, and then if I take my kids to the park, there's another two trips, and then if we go out with our friends, there I'm at 12 trips already, non-work related. So sometimes it's not the trip we're worried about, it's when the trip is happening. And sometimes a lot of trips happen at one time, and it has nothing at all to do with the number of trips. It, happens, it just happens to be that we're all trying to make a trip at the same time, and oh my God, we're shocked everyone's there. I can't believe it. 
You're all on University Parkway at 5 o'clock. What are you doing there? So the third piece is multimodal transportation that came up a lot, and this should come as no surprise. So there's, you know, the basic kind of modes of transportation we talk about. You have your, you have your automobile, you have your bicycle, you have your, you know, you know, you're on foot, or you have your mass transit, you know, signified by a bus. And most of it, we talk about these types in the multimodal. We know about the car, and there were kind of four questions that were brought up uh, in, in this series about these that I think is important, or at least emerging for things that were suggestions that the community think about. And the first part was, is it safe? How do you make this type of transportation safe? In a couple slides, we saw uh, <coughs> different bike path configurations where there were ballards uh, outside the road, so it protected, it protected bicyclists from, from cars or people that are walking on the sidewalks. I think it was Rick showed some pictures of how you, when you park cars on the side of the road and you, and you have a car barrier between the, the sidewalk and the road, how much safer that makes the pedestrian feel. And so when you're thinking about street design, you know, one of, the, one of the key pieces for multimodal transportation is, is, is it safe? Second piece is, is it efficient? Um, we talked a little bit about headways, and, and headways, for those of you who don't know, in mass transit is how often does something happen? So for headways for a bus, for example, is how often does it stop by the same stop? And if you've got 60 minutes or 30 minutes, and, y and it only takes you 10 minutes to get where you're going, it can really create things that are inefficient in the system. Uh, and so when you look at how efficient is the system, and this is really for all of them, how efficient is it when you get into the system, whether you're, you're a bicyclist or a pedestrian or, or, or you're on a mass transit, how efficient is it? Is it convenient? Can I do it easily? Is it a path of least resistance? Uh, because for most people, the car is the path of least resistance. If you're going to promote multimodal transportation, human nature says you better make it a lot more convenient than a car because otherwise... You know, we're just going to stick with the car. And another interesting concept was, is it dignified? Um, you know, when I came down, uh, you know, mass transit, where I came from uh, a little over a decade ago, it wasn't very dignified. You don't want to get on a bus. That wasn't a dignified uh, sense of transportation. Andrew put it really well. When you get into a, a walkway, uh, you're in a crosswalk, and it's, it's three feet wide, and you feel like you've got to run across the way because you don't have enough time. You don't feel very dignified. But you've seen some street crossings that are they're different. They're demarcated maybe by a different type of brick, different type of color. They're wide. You feel dignified walking through it. You feel dignified as a bicyclist. You feel dignified as a mass transit user. You feel good using it. You don't feel like I got to make sure I put my head down because I don't want people to think I got a DUI. Um, it's a it's a good thing. It's something you want to do. And there's some interesting uh, stuff going on in the Florida Department of Transportation that you can read about. And, and one of the more emerging hot topics, I guess, is the complete street concept. So as we design streets in the area, what you have is streets that are designed for every single mode. So it's, it's designed not just for vehicles, but it's designed for bicycles and pedestrians and mass transit. And you're thinking about all the modes that go into it. So what do we do as we move forward here to make sure we think about when we're designing something, how does it accommodate more than one mode? And that plays really well into the force with this contextual street design, which is something else if you're a, you know, a nerd, you can look up. Department of Transportation does again, which is context classification. And so what it says is, okay, let's acknowledge the fact that we have very different types of land uses, right? I live out near the ag lands, and so I'm, I'm, like, I'm in this kind of, like I'm in between here where I live, you know, out near there's a lot of cows and things going on. We're kind of right in here, you know? And so the sense is, and, and we've used Fruitville Road as an example a lot, if you're out at Fruitville Road at I-75, should Fruitville Road at I-75 look exactly the same as Fruitville Road at 301? You know, when you're heading into the city, should it look the same? Or do we acknowledge the fact that you're moving through different classifications of roadway system? As you head down US-41, you might feel like US-41 from Clark Road down to Sarasota Square Mall could look very different than it does when it's heading into Venice. Because you're in a different area, and it's, it's not on, it's, I guess it's not a real departure to think about it's okay as a, for a road to change as you go along it. It doesn't need to do those things, and I think that's the, the piece of contextual street design um, that was being brought up. And it's the same as we're going, you might, if you're paying attention to the form-based code that the city of Sarasota was developing, it's the same kind of concept where you think about your land uses and your roadway systems based on where you are, not as a continuum across the whole thing. Uh, because it does change, and, and maybe it should change, maybe it shouldn't, but that's the idea behind it. So 
that were just those were just four I think emerging themes that I thought were as we watched over and we, we picked them up and said hey they mentioned this they mentioned this that I thought were really uh, relevant for the conversation moving forward and, and where do we go from here in terms of how do we think of things so is it important for us to focus on creating more internal capture how do you create more mixed use type developments where people don't necessarily need to get in their car and go on a major arterial road to get where they're going. Uh, how do you create more pass-by capture if you understand where the major economic centers are and you know people traverse from one place to another? Do you set up systems along the way that make sure that they don't need to depart too much because it doesn't create extra trips? It's interesting. When you look in Sarasota County, uh, I forget what year it was, it might have been 2000, they do a level of service study. And at peak hour, there was still room. There was still room for about 250,000 trips on the roadway network. At peak hour, they just weren't distributed correctly. And so, if you think about how you distribute them right, there's plenty of room there. But you see parallel roadway segments that are failing, right near roadway segments that aren't failing. If people just went to the next roadway segment, they would be on a non-failing road. But we don't have that because we might not be setting up our pass-by capture correctly. We might not be setting up the things where people want to stop along the way. They actually have to depart to do that. Um, and then thinking about the contextual street design and the multimodal uses uh, and the importance of the grid. And it's, I, I don't see us necessarily stopping building road anytime soon, but you know, does, does it make more sense to invest money in connecting, making connections rather than making lanes? I mean, you're making lanes either way, but is the connection the more important piece? And so with that, um, I will introduce my partner in this event has really been uh, most, of the, most of the workhorse on this, uh, a former chair of the Chamber of Commerce and partner at Hoyt Architects, Chris Gallagher. Thank you, Kevin. Well, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. We, um, when we began this, conversation several months ago about what to do about uh, transportation and traffic in Sarasota, there were some central themes that emerged for us at the Chamber of Commerce in terms of what was the end result that we wanted to uh, arrive at. And I want to share some of those ideas with you um, for a couple of different reasons. One, so that you uh, see where we were coming from, but also so you can do your own brainstorming about this. Um, we thought if we brought a number of speakers in who, uh, again, we gave a little bit free reign to just present ideas to us, they might be ideas that the chamber agreed with and didn't agree with. Um, they might be uh, 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 speakers that the community might agree with, think they have good ideas or bad ideas, but we wanted to sort of, in a sense, do some brainstorming. In fact, we'd like to do a little bit of that here today. Um, and we also want, you know, a lot of times when you're, when you're trying to figure things out, you will, uh, you know, if you're, tr if you're trying to be effective, you will say, well, what are the top three most important things that we could do? What are the top three most important infrastructure changes we could make or planning changes or whatever it is? And <coughs> in, in our conversations, I, I threw this idea up against the wall and said, you know, there's another way to look at this thing. Um, there's a, there was a book written, God, 30 years ago now. Uh, some of you know uh, Christopher Alexander, who's an architect uh, and a planner from, he was, uh, was at Berkeley for many years. And he wrote several books, and one of them was a book called The Oregon Experiment. And the, that book was about the University of Oregon uh, in terms of their master planning for their campus. And he had a concept in there that I loved, and uh, I, I think about it a lot in terms of just in terms of you know your own home. Uh, I ran a school for five years, so we always had lots of facility improvements we had to make. And the idea was this: that <coughs> rather than you know putting all your your eggs into a great big basket of major infrastructure projects, that what you really ought to do is break it down. Uh, that you ought to have in any particular year, you might have a hundred small, cheap, inexpensive, easy to do projects that people can get their heads wrapped around and you get them done quickly. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got that one big thing that's got to be bonded out for 30 years. It's a ton of dough. It's a lot of work. It's going to take three years to construct, et cetera. And then depending on how, f how uh, in the weeds you want to get there, there's stuff in the middle that 
they might be, it might be a thing that'll take you a year to get accomplished, get the funding together. <coughs> but it, you can see how this works, again, in your own home budget. You can see how it will work on a campus, and you can see how it can work in a community where, you know, you're just thinking at several different levels, and those fun, cheap things might be like for the did, putting some flowers in downtown that, you know, aren't going to change downtown, but they make a, you know, relatively inexpensive impact that people notice. And then again, there's this other thing where we're going to, well, we're going to extend the sidewalks out and do that kind of stuff. And again, lots more dollars, lots more conversations to be had, got to borrow money, all that kind of thing. So when we were thinking about this, and as we go back to the Chamber of Commerce, and I, you know, here's, uh, here's another important part of this thing. You know, every time a problem comes up in a community, we certainly see this at the national level. We see it here locally all the time. You, you know, the entire community can start stamping its feet and pounding its fists and saying, something ought to be done. The city commission ought to do something. The state legislature ought to do something. The federal government ought to do something. And in, in all of those problems, they, they, they may likely be a role for all of those levels of government. But in most every situation, there are lots of roles. There are lots of things that any one of us can do in our spe whatever specific little role we might have, whether that's just simply a resident of a community, whether that's we own a business, whether we're an employee of a business, uh, whether we sit on some kind of advisory board, whether an elected official, um, whether we, uh, we uh, work in some city department. Every one of us, if you put your thinking cap on, can come up with some ideas of, of where we might go. You want to hit the first slide here, Kevin? I'm not sure how. Uh, and, and again, here is, here is this, this notion again of small and quick, moderate, near term, large, long range. And we s what we, and I, I just counted out here, we were doing some brainstorming. We came up with like 36 different roles that you might participate, you might possibly have. And again, if you did some brainstorming and said, what could we do in this role to help mitigate automobile congestion in our community? And, and let me, let me I, and I want to walk through these and actually maybe if you go to the next slide, Kevin, I'm not sure how you queued these up here. You keep going? Keep going? You see at the bottom, we're changing everything else staying the same. So let's, let's, go, let's stop at this one for a second, employers. If you were an employer here in Sarasota County, the city of Sarasota, what could you do, your small piece of the pie, to help mitigate traffic congestion? Now, again, let me give you a little bit different, uh, another piece of the context here. Some of you uh, watched this emerging story on Longbow Key where they're doing this traffic study to figure out how they might mitigate some of the congestion in Longbow Key. And part of the early news that came out was, well, we're going to look at some things that might improve things by 20%. As we go through these list of things, none of these things are going to make congestion go away by themselves. But when you think about each one of them, they may, maybe if they make a half a percent difference or a percent difference, or in some cases, maybe it's a big difference. Maybe you get 3% difference. But when you add all those things up, you actually can make, you know, improve the quality of life of people, perhaps really make a, a difference in the congestion picture, and again, ultimately create a better community for ourselves. You know, one of the other themes that uh, Kevin didn't mention was, <coughs> I think you saw in most of the speakers, if you were here, that congestion is not going away. Um, it's, it's and, it, and that's not just Sarasota, across the country. We know that there's new technology emerging, and my own opinion about it as I watch it is, and I, I, I've, I've joked with a couple people uh, recently about, I was out one Sunday morning doing my jog, and I, I'm coming back, and I see these two scooters that are pushing, pulling signs, advertising. And I'm imagining, okay, what happens when you no longer have to pay a driver? You've now got this self-driving vehicle that you can put advertising on. Do you think that's going to add, that's, that's going to reduce congestion? Or do you think that's going to increase in congestion? Seems to me there's going to be some very inter interesting conversations going on in city halls all over America 
because all of a sudden there's going to be a bunch of vehicles driving around that are just advertising stuff with not having nothing to do with moving people around. They're just advertising. It'll be tricky. And, you know, again, in terms of the, the self-driving cars, is it really going to help with automobile congestion? I, I don't, uh, again, we're all, we can only guess at this point. I don't necessarily believe it's going to happen. I think you're going to, you know, people will take advantage of that. You, you imagine that, that you're going, you're going to stop into the convenience store on Main Street for five minutes. That self-driving car presumably won't have to park. What will it do? It will circle around the block a few times waiting for you to finish your errand. Then you'll get back in the car and head back off. Or maybe there's some other car will pick you up. Bottom line is, I don't think we're going to, it's not going to solve the congestion problem. So I don't think, I don't think just because we're getting auto, you know, self-driving automobiles and vehicles, we're going to solve congestion problems. And I think, again, that theme is this thing is not going away. So how do you mitigate, if it's not going away across America, how do you mitigate for it? How do you make, you know, for y in your personal life, how do you make your experience transporting yourself around your community more pleasant? And then for every one of us that has a role, how do we provide for a situation where, again, there are alternatives? You are not stuck on that miserable route that, you know, that is the only way to get from A to B. How do you create a uh, diversity of options? I think it has been, a, it is certainly in my time of the chamber, it's a theme that I, has always interested me in providing a diversity of options, whether that's a diversity of options in housing styles, a diversity, uh, you know, if you want to live out east of the highway on a five-acre tract, that's great. If you want to live in a condo in the middle of downtown, that's great. We, as a, as a community, we ought to provide for those kind of options. If you like to shop at Walmart, that's great. If you like to shop at a high-end store in the middle of the Central Core, that's great. And again, I, I think, you know, we have a richer community because we have all kinds of different places to live, to shop, to worship, to go to school, and this certainly, I think, falls into this category of mobility. So, coming back to what can employers do. Uh, I have a son that lives in Austin, Texas. And when he got his first job in Austin, he uh, showed up and he got an apartment downtown. He didn't have a car. And surprise, surprise, he walked in and he, you know, they, they had, he had arranged what his salary was going to be. And he got a little bonus. The bonus was 200 bucks a month because he didn't have a car. And he wasn't going to chew up parking space in the facility. So, that is not unheard of. Maybe premature here in Sarasota, but that kind of thing is done. You could also provide, and, it, and I, uh, this certainly happens in my own office. I know there's, uh, we've got people that show up as early as 7.30 in the morning and some that show up at 9.30 in the morning and everything in between. If everyone had to be there precisely at 8, we, you know, imagine what the impact we're having on Fruitville Road as people are trying to get to work together. But if every place in, in Sarasota had flex time, or, you know, and again, obviously some places can't do that, but it just, again, spreads things out and allows uh, more flexibility. Employers could also create, again, other options and other incentives for people to do something other than bring a car and add to the automobile congestion. They could provide, again, very convenient quarters for bikes. They could provide showers. and. It's, it, and again, if you're an employee and you start to doing some brainstorming about that, you can start to see how could I improve the life of the quality of life of my employee, and how can I, secondly, how can I uh, reduce the impact, the uh, congestion on the roads? Again, Kevin, flip it forward. What can philanthropy do? Uh, this one was an interesting uh, brain uh, twister for me. Uh, you know that one of our uh, one of our sponsors here is Gulf Coast Community Foundation. I don't know the internal conversations that Gulf Coast Community Foundation has had about transportation traffic. Uh, presumably, they've had some because they wanted to help fund this uh, little project we did here. But if if they were to go back, that board were to say to themselves, "Okay, what could we do as a local foundation to help mitigate traffic congestion here?" And it didn't take lo long for me to start coming up with a list of things that the foundations could do. Uh, and just, again, if you start imagining yourself. The, a lot of the things that we talk about here are things that you might experiment with, you know, this new feature, this new bike lane, this new, uh, we all witnessed Bee Ridge Road for two years where a lane was completely tied up and life went on. Something happened, even though we had one less lane. 
those kind of experiments are happening around America, and foundations could help fund the study of that thing, those kind of things. They could help the fund the implementation of them, and then ultimately help uh, help uh, you know be a catalyst for if something does really work to help fund it and make it more effective. Um, so again, there's a role that th there's there's certainly a role they can have, and I and I hope that they will uh, you know take advantage of that kind of thinking going going and looking at this problem. Slide it, go ahead again. Mass transit. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, uh, several years ago, our two local MCAT and, and uh, Mantee and SCAT here in Sarasota, uh, there was a conversation about them possibly joining forces uh, amongst the county commissioners, both both communities. Uh, that there is the beginnings, the rumblings of that conversation. Again, you heard one of our speakers say that that is happening around the United States, where uh, and, and not only are they combining forces, but there's there's a public-private element that comes into it to make for more efficiency in those systems. Um, Kevin talked about s this notion again of making them uh, a more dignified ride. There were all kinds of things in terms of uh, apps that some of which you saw. Uh, in terms of better maps, in terms of better communication about what's available, uh, you know, it, it does does everyone realize you can go from downtown to the airport? Uh, and how often would you do that to avoid, you know, parking fees up at the airport while you're gone away for the weekend? There's there's a ton of things that could be happening with rat mass transit to encourage us to do that. Getting to the beaches, there's all kinds of things that could be done, and and it really takes them putting on their thinking caps and saying, you know, asking the hard questions about it. Next, Kevin. The media, uh, one of our other sponsors, SRQ Media Group. Um, a lot of what we were trying to do here is elevate the conversation. Uh, Kevin talked about this a little bit earlier. How do you have a better conversation as a community about what, you know, again, we can all stamp our feet and say City Hall or the County Administration, or the, you know, Ringling Boulevard needs to do something about our traffic problem. Um, and that, again, is a piece of the picture. But there's a ton of stuff that we can do, and again, the media has, an, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, applaud. Uh, I've got to applaud the the uh, Herald Tribune. Uh, extraordinary job of bringing this message out, putting it on there, instead of just, oh my God, we got a traffic problem, and then quoting three people that hate traffic, and you know, that's the end of the story. This this thing was really about getting that stuff out there, and wouldn't it be great when you know the snowboards are all back? that those stories are better stories across the media, the magazines, the newspapers, um, because we just took it up just a little bit, a, a notch, and we're having better conversations about possibility. Go ahead, Kevin. What can the chamber do? <coughs> the chamber is going to take the, uh, the results of these things, the results of brainstorming. We're going to be going, we have two councils within the Chamber of Commerce, the, the City Priorities Council and the uh, Government Issues Council. And they are going to be tasked with some very hard brainstorming to come up with a, again, cheap, quick, medium scale, large scale, what do we need to advocate for, uh, the projects and the things that could be implemented, the strategies and tactics that will help improve that situation in this community. So they, and, and again, we expect them to come out with a marching orders for, okay, what do we, you know, and again, instead of us complaining every month we get together about traffic, what can we really do as a community? What can we do as a chamber with uh, 15, 1,600 members? Uh, again, simple things like educating the employers about options that they can do to help mitigate traffic congestion. Next. Tourists. Um, I, what can s Visit Sarasota do? Um, you know, th so much of what goes on here is the tourists show up, the snowbirds show up, and they, if, if they want to get from Stickney Point to downtown, they grab 41 and head up. And Swift and Tuttle is just one block away. Um, so if you think about it, let's suppose, would you imagine Visit Sor Sarasota took upon one of their important tasks because they want the experience to be pleasant for people to come and visit that they come up with, you know, advertising, here are apps, here are other mobility options, here are other routes, here are ways to get to the beach, and they made that part of their mission to help explain to visitors other wa ways other than the standard route that if they look at their Google Maps is going to be the most supposedly direct, but not necessarily the most pleasant route to get from one place to another. Next. 
Uh, what can business I do? I, I mentioned employers before, and again, I think that, that the employers is one piece of this thing, but uh, businesses that are, are trying to make it attractive for people to come, again, making it easy for multimodal transportation for to get dropped off, things get shipped. I, again, if they put their thinking caps on about how can I best serve my customer and how can I help with the congestion, peak hour, peak season congestion in Sarasota, they, they, the list would be very long of what businesses could do to help uh, mitigate that next. Law enforcement. Uh, one of the first, the first thing, when we first introduced the subject at the beginning uh, back several weeks ago, we talked about automobile congestion, and there is that automobile congestion that is caused because everybody's trying to get to the same place at the same time. There are other causes of automobile congestion. One of them is events, special events. Every time we have a fair downtown combined with the farmer's market in the middle of downtown, we get congestion around downtown. There's also congestion that happens because of accidents on the roadway. And there are congest there's congestion that happens because there is road work being done. Again, if law enforcement uh, in partnership with parking departments and in partnership with the uh, procurement departments, we're asking the question again, how do we keep this thing as clear flowing as we possibly can during peak hour, peak season? And that was just a standard protocol. How do you do that? How do you, when, when there is an accident, how do you, again, during peak hour, peak season, how do you most quickly get that road back? How do you get your investigation out of, you know, out of the way and, and getting the road work, work be doing being done? Again, lots that, uh, that uh, our local police departments could do, sheriff's, sheriff's department. Again, obviously, huge role here for planners, architects, designers, um, in making places that, again, have lots of mobility options. And again, there's this absolutely central uh, issue in here of just making, you know, the, 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 um, the city commission just put appointed a uh, tree advisory committee uh, yesterday. Um, and they, they could potentially have a huge role in this notion of making our streets more pleasant. And if they're more pleasant, it will encourage walking, biking, and even if you are, are in a car, and even if you are stuck in traffic, if the street experience is more pleasant, the aggravation level goes down. Your experience on Main Street, if you are behind a couple of cars at an intersection, versus your experience uh, coming up the South Trail 41, are two different experiences, because there are pedestrians out there, there's street life, and it just is a more interesting experience. There's shade hanging over the, the uh, street. It's a whole different thing. Huge role for the planning departments in our local communities, and for obviously for the commissions that uh, oversee them. Next. Schools. Uh, I think we might talk about schools a little bit here. We've got a, we actually have a group from the Education Foundation who asked if they could spend a couple of minutes with you tonight. They have a, a program they do, it's a hackathon, I guess it's called, and the best and the brightest try and come up with some ideas about uh, what could we do to solve school problems? And wouldn't you know that one of the th problems they came up with is how do we get around, how do we get to school? How do we get to after school activities? Uh, many, of, um, for, for many students, you know, this is, this is a, a middle school and high school, many of whom these kids don't have licenses yet or cars or things to get around. So they, they ask themselves the question, and again, in our emerging high-tech world, you, this, these questions are being asked all over the place. Uh, one of our speakers talked about all the different apps that are available. These guys put together a, a new app, uh, one that could work here in Sarasota County. So we thought we'd give them a few minutes to explain how this app worked. And again, one more piece. If, they, if this could you know, solve one more piece of this thing and provide a whole set of options for, for you know, that we, when we talk about this multimobility, it isn't, it isn't about getting rid of the cars. It isn't about saying the cars aren't a part of that. What it, part of what it's saying, though, is there is a whole group of people at each end of this age spectrum who do not have the option of driving themselves around. They're below 16 and they can't drive, or they're too young, or they don't own a car, and at the other end of the spectrum, they're too old to drive, or they don't own a car, or something again, and, and everyone in between, again, who can't afford a car. So 
these guys did some creative thinking, and we thought we'd uh, give them an opportunity to share with you the app that they've put together. So who wants to take the lead on this? Why don't you, why don't you introduce, introduce yourself and introduce your future. Howdy, everyone. Uh, I'm Liam Hines. I'm a senior at Venice High School, and uh, I guess I'll just pass around so we can get everyone in here. I'm Barrett Manstini. I'm a eighth grader at Pine View School. I'm Anastasia Samedi, and I go to Booker Middle, and I'm a seventh grade. No, okay. Can <laughs> 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 we... Can I get the next slide? So when um, <laughs> when we were looking at our problem, one of the things we realized is that um, as a community in Sarasota, we try to offer every single opportunity we can for students. And one of the big uh, things that we do is school choice. But one of the problems we identified is that no matter uh, how open you make schools and how many of these opportunities you try to give to um, students all across the county, you have so many great schools, yet people are traveling so far to get there. And uh, a lot of the things we noticed that it isn't just people who uh, may be too young to drive yet. We saw people who their parents aren't able to drive them because they're both working. People who have after school activities who can't catch the bus home. And then uh, especially people who aren't even in the busing range to begin with. So uh, one of the uh, big influences in deciding this is, uh, unfortunately couldn't be here with us tonight, but um, our friend Ricky, he was actually from Orlando. And uh, one of the big problems they had was their school choice was a little different. Theirs was uh, based academic-wise, where as long as you had uh, high enough grades, you go, go to whichever school you liked in the area. And so the problem Ricky had was he was in an area where his school that he could be bused to and that he was assigned to wasn't necessarily the best. But, you know, he worked hard. He had the grades. But he couldn't get to uh, the other schools that he was able to enroll in purely due to transportation. And so when, as a group, we looked at this, we saw that uh, even when these opportunities are available, that one of the biggest problems in realizing these opportunities is the transportation and getting our students there. So that was our first and foremost priority, to uh, provide access to all these students, to not only uh, this accessibility, but uh, reliable transportation, so that way uh, it doesn't matter what sort of solution you can offer if they can't get the same ride every single day, every single week. And uh, most importantly, safe, because it's not just students that we're reaching out to, it's parents. And no matter what service you offer, if you don't have the utmost safety that your child is getting home safely, then there's really no point there. So uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to my friends here for more technical aspects. The user experience, we have a multi-platform experience, which includes a separate platform for parents, students, and drivers. The parents have both a scheduling section and a monitoring or tracking section. You can schedule trips for each of your children or child for different activities, and for including going to school, coming home from school, and extracurricular activities. Once the trip is scheduled, you can track the student, and it'll tell you if they are in the car, out of the car, and how long it is until they get into the trip, off the trip, and watch you the whole step of the way. Also, on the scheduling screen, you can schedule for every day of the week, including daily, weekly, and biweekly schedules for each of your children as selected. The students have a comfortable experience, which allow you to track the s trips already scheduled for you. For example, it will want it will tell you exactly when your driver is arriving and if scrolled upwards, it will show you the information about the driver, including their name, the time of arrival, and their vehicle to help further inform you. Oh. The, student, the student can also schedule certain, if given permission, they can also schedule certain rides of their own, for example, when set, they can schedule, for example, school, home, and ballet practice. Um, with their driver experience, um, they can see who needs to be picked up from where and where they need to go. Um, they can see what times, what days of the week, and if they need to go to that same place more than two times a week or something like that. Um, with the drivers, they are back on check and 
um, they are able to get car good karma points, and with the karma points, they can um, they can um, buy get rewards like discounts off somewhere or coupons to somewhere. Um, our game plan we um we wanted to get our word out, and with these organizations and programs, we're um we're planning to get the word out about our app such as MySES, which students have access to. So when we uh, first uh, presented this and we were looking at our startup costs, uh, one of the big things we saw was that um, overall the project would cost um, almost $200,000, which when we looked at that, we thought that was a great number, but uh, when we presented that and we said that it would be a completely nonprofit and it would be all donations, uh, the Education Foundation kind of looked at us a little funny, so we thought that was a great selling point, but apparently it's not. Uh, but uh, one of the big things we did uh, also see was infrastructure costs, that once we can finally get it off the ground, it would only be $500 every month. So, and uh, due to the fact it would be completely, the, we envisioned it as a nonprofit. Um, that's uh, in the realm of grants and donations, we saw that as easily manageable, and so uh, that once it uh, could get running, it would definitely be a permanent part of the community and to make sure that we could continue offering these sorts of rides and these opportunities for our students. And so that's uh, really all we had to say. Um, I had something really crazy last time, but it seemed to be a little different atmosphere, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th thank you for having us here tonight. And I really enjoyed presenting it to you all. Thank you very much. <coughs> And I, you guys were the winners. There were several apps. That the how many cont contestants were there? There was uh, ten teams. Ten teams. And uh, about 100 students, I think. Just somewhere in there, 100 right over there. And this was selected by the judges as the best. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so what we would like to do now is uh, we'd like to sort of open this up to the crowd. And I'll, st I'll start this going, and I, and I think we've got probably room for maybe, like, off the top of your head, your ten best ideas. And this, again, this could be on the scale of very small, quick, cheap sort of idea, or the real big one. So I'm going to throw a couple out that I've been sort of joking around about, but just, you know, and again, you've recognized you've got, you've got, uh, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce is here, the president of the Chamber of Commerce is here. Uh, we've got folks from the Gulf Coast Community Foundation here. We've got uh, s people from the planning board here. We've got people from the DSA here. Um, we've got, uh, again, professional planners, architects. Um, you know, who else did I forget? Oh, we've got people, f again, from the media. SRQ Media is here, and Herald Tribune is here. So. Um, Again, just in a, in a sentence, you know, one of those ideas. So let me, let me start it. I'll give you two ideas. Uh, and, and, and again, if you would, in suggesting your idea, who would do this? Who, whose role would this be to do? So here's the first one. Uh, this would be, I think we'd have to rely on the state to actually pull this off. But the idea is we put a toll on the bridge going out to Longboat Key. We take the money and we build a second bridge, or we build a tunnel, or we build some other infrastructure that we need to help, you know, deal with that issue. Or we, you know, help fund the ferries or whatever we're going to do. But you create this uh, source, and at the same time, you put a little bit of pain on the bridge. Uh, and maybe it's again, maybe it's only during peak hours. All the technology is there to do that to discourage people from going during peak hours. So there's one idea. Again, sort of. You know, not terribly expensive, probably ter tremendously politically expensive, uh, but there's one thought. The second thought is, again, which I think is relatively cheap and I think would be pretty effective, is we put a, and this, this one out, out, the role here, I would throw this to one of the foundations or the chamber, uh, get a webcam, a live webcam, and you put it at the intersection uh, going out to Lido and you put one out at the, uh, the mall. So at any point, you could get on your phone, you can see what the traffic conditions look like, and made a decision about, am I going to go there right now? How does the traffic look? And it's live 24 hours. 
you could run advertising on it, and again, you'd get a real live picture of what's going on. So there's my two to start you. So let's, let's see if we can get top ten here. You've got the ears of these different organizations, and let's see who's got an idea that we can add to it. John, yes. Synchronized traffic signals. Thank you. Next. Yes. Jay. All right, better, better wayfinding. Uh, I had actually put this on. I had put this on the list for parking department. One of the things they could do is, again, you think about a Saturday morning in downtown Sarasota when everything's getting all bound up with a festival in the farmers market. Uh, you know, more signs to get to park. You know, off Fruitville Road and off Ringling, how to get to parking garages and parking lots and that kind of thing. So again, more signage and wayfinding. Number two. So number three, who's got a third idea here? Toll plaza coming the other direction over the bridge. And it presumably, we'd have to do one on the north end as well, because all of a sudden, everyone would be driving down the north end of the thing. So, OK. Number four. Yes. All right, Dan took two, so we're up to <laughs> we're up to six now. Yes, right behind you. <laughs> An ordinance that would prevent snowbirds from being on the roads at certain times. Okay. <laughs> okay. Use the use the resources from ticketing for that to build a bridge. Yes, in the back, number eight. Okay, well marketed uh, and, and uh, wayfinding f st for uh, for getting to the beaches from the mainland. Yes, Francine. Yes. Um, wider intersections. Wider intersections. Okay, all right. We got one more. Uh, in the very back row there. Uh, back row, right behind you, Jay. Ah. Ah, an app that's measuring how few miles you're driving to get around in your life. Very trendy. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we've got to, we again have to thank our sponsors here. They've been so uh, helpful for us. First, uh, the Tableside Group for uh, holding, allowing us to he hold each one of these events here. SRQ Media, uh, Liesl and West, thank you so much for your participation. Um, again, Gulf Coast Community Foundation, Chamber of Commerce. Again, uh, Herald Tribune, thanks for you for all of your support. Uh, great story in the obser Observer last week, so thank you all for your support. Am I missing anything, Kevin? Oh, and Eric Collins, for who has been responsible for putting all these videos together, making those available to you. And, I, and the last thing is, you know, if, if you had a, you know, when you, as soon as you walk out of here, when you have that uh, burning notion of idea of something you'd else you'd like to contribute, there is, again, communications at sarasotachamber.com. Uh, ha happy to receive your ideas. And uh, we do wish that uh, all of you, whatever role you've got, will do some brainstorming and think about how we can uh, improve congestion mitigation here in Sarasota. Thank you all.